All right. Uh, thank you for joining uh, the um, Massachusetts Pirate Party Fall 2023 conference. I guess I'll stand here. Um, mm -hmm. Got something. Whatever. Um, so we try to have these once a quarter. Um, there'll be one in May that will be online uh, using this button uh, tool that we're using. And uh, thanks to Agaric for, again, hosting that. It's a really good tool. And, and um, so that in that one, we'll have um, elections for a new slate of, or a new set of candidates um, for all of our various officer positions and the like. Um, but what I'm here to talk about is choosing the right campaign to run. Um, as you may or may not know, the election coming up is uh, federal, state, and town. Um, okay. um, but before I start, um, I, you know, we come out of a remix culture, um, and life is a remix. So of course, take whatever you want out of these, which we will post. Um, and use as you want. Uh, you know, always learn from your effort, or learn from your efforts, and you know, and iterate, iterate, iterate in, in the software parlance. And most importantly, just put it out there. Um, you can't win if you don't run. But we'll talk more about why it's important to not just think about winning. So I, I, don't be Sisyphus. We don't want to be pushing a rock um, up, a, <clears throat> up a mountain over and over and over again and not learning from that. Um, running for office in Massachusetts is difficult. 60% of the Massachusetts legislature runs unopposed in uh, a general election, and we're having one coming up in 2024 that, and we'll talk about more about that, and even town and city elections aren't always competitive. Um, you know, maybe in the 50s, 1950s, there were a lot more people running. Now we see fewer and fewer. <clears throat> um, but while Democrats and Republicans are political operatives, and they're political parties that are focused on the candidates as political operatives running their own individual campaigns. We aren't. We have multiple goals of what we're trying to achieve simply because we don't have, in the case of the Democrats, 80% of the legislature. Um, we have other objectives that we can accomplish, even if we just run a paper campaign. So three, th three general things to think about when running. One is the candidate is there to educate voters about the issues that matter to the candidate. So pirates have our set of issues, libertarians, they have their set of issues that, and some overlap and there's not some overlap. But predominantly, we want to educate voters. Uh, from that effort, we want to identify supporters and we want to identify, identify volunteers, both for this campaign and, most importantly, for future efforts. We have to think about campaigns not as this person runs for office, I support them, they win or lose, and that's just it. But as a series of iterative efforts that are going to build, <clears throat> that are going to reach out to larger and larger numbers of people. And then ultimately to win is icing on the cake. If we win with all of the barriers in front of us, that's great. But that's not our only objective. We should never think about it as, 
That is our only objective. And if we don't do that, then we're a failure. So ideally, a campaign wants to do all three. It wants to reach out to voters. It wants to identify supporters. And it wants to win. But if you don't run, you can't accomplish any of these goals. So just take a step back. What are the offices that um, we have to worry about? Well, of course, there's federal elections in even years. So that's, um, you know, president, U.S. US Senate, U.S. House of Representatives. Um, we as the Pirate Party uh, focus on, at most, U.S. House of Representatives, simply for the reason that so many campaigns that I've seen in the past when I was with the Greens, Green Rainbows, would focus on, well, we have to get someone on the ballot and we have to go out and get our candidate there so that voters once every two years can vote for us. And that's great, but that doesn't build anything. That doesn't go out and it takes a lot of effort to gather 10,000 or 15,000 signatures ultimately, to get on the ballot and then just kind of get exhausted and not do the door knocking and campaign organizing that you're going to need to identify voters. So the way we as the Pirates took is we, it's important to run someone for, if we can, for U.S. House of Representatives, simply because it uh, is a federal office and a lot of our policy, you know, copyright isn't generally something that's taken, um, isn't something that's a factor in a state election, largely. Um, free software is, you know, having the state government go and use open source and software, that's important and that's a pirate issue, but, um, we have to be able to run people for U.S. House of Representatives, but running people statewide for Senate, for president, often doesn't yield a lot. And so um, the focus is on U.S. House of Representatives and lower. So, um, you know, there's state and county elections every, every e on even years, there's town elections every year, and there's city elections in odd years. So U.S. House elections, there are nine districts, all are held by Democrats, all with large war chests. Um, getting on the ballot takes 2,000 valid signatures at a minimum. Um, and of course, your opponent, if they want to bump you off the ballot, can challenge some of those signatures. And what happens is, well, <clears throat> that may be for another session, but the point is you, you want to get, you want to aim for 2,500 or 3,000 valid signatures, which means potentially more, um, <clears throat> potentially more um, signatures in total. 3,000 is a, a good poll, so 50% more. Papers are available February 2024, about the middle of the month and they're due in July 2024. So you have, whereas the Democrats and Republicans have 10 weeks to gather all their signatures, we have many more weeks to do that, which is to our advantage. So for State House and Senate, uh, Massachusetts General Court is made up of 160 House members and 40 state Elections are held in November of even years, and both bodies are overwhelmingly Democratic, roughly 80 to 85 percent. But, you know, as I said, candidates are fundamentally political operatives, politically, um, <clears throat> they're their own people. The Democratic Party doesn't say, "Oh well, here is here is what we are what we've told you to run on. Uh, you have to implement this policy." It 
goes through, and we have a video about the problems of the legislature, um, and how it's very much controlled by uh, the Speaker of the House and the Senate President. Um, you know, for a for for a state that is so democracy, we have very undemocratic legislature, very authoritarian legislature, and. Uh, while it's overwhelmingly democratic, we routinely see things that the Democratic Party supports that just don't go anywhere within the legislature. Um, I mean, literally, the, the th we are the only state where the three, the legislature, the executive, and the uh, judiciary are immune <laughs> from Freedom of Information Act laws. It doesn't apply to them. Uh, we are seeing that um, the uh, state auditor is saying, no, 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 I'm going to audit you. Uh, and, you know, more power to her to do that. But um, <clears throat> they, they like their power and they don't want to be second guessed. Certainly not by rules. All right, so to get on the ballot in the House and Senate. Um, so you need 150 valid voters for the House. That is doable. That is doable in the time amounted. Uh, you have 300 valid voters for the Senate. So about 450 for the Senate raw signatures and um, 225 House raw signatures. And there's ways of improving your odds of getting good signatures. Um, the papers are available, so this is different than the federal. The papers are available before, again, midway through the month, and they're due in the end of April 2024 to your cities and towns. Uh, so that they validate and then they've got a month to put them in. So functionally, you have, you have 10 weeks. So county elections, you know, there's lots of county offices. There's county commissioner, district attorney, county treasurer. I didn't even talk about governor's council, which eight governor's council people. And uh, anyways, they don't do a whole heck of a lot. But the commissioner, district attorney, county treasurer, register of probate, register of deeds, and sheriff and clerk of courts. And it would be great to have pir pirates run for sheriff. I think that would be a fundamental change. Um, for town elections, so where elections coming up, they're always held in the first half of the year. Um, generally, there's offices such as select board, town moderator, treasurer, school committee, um, but there's also yeah, covered, uh, elected town meeting. Like in Arlington, we have a pirate who's uh, an elected town meeting. And uh, they only need like 10 signatures to get on the ballot. And functionally, you only need like 50 to 100 people to vote for you. And oftentimes, there's like four seats at the same time. And so you have to get, a, you have to get, you have to be within that top four to win. Um, it's unpaid. So many town elections are, in fact, unpaid or not well paid, um, which is good. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but uh, you have to keep that in mind. City elections, next city, well, we've got city elections coming up for this year. Uh, mayor, city council, I don't think there's a board of aldermen at all anymore, when I think about it. Uh, school committee, things like that. Most of those are either at large, like Medford, I think, is all at large. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe they, they added some districts. Somerville, where I live, is four are at large, i.e. all through the city, and you have to be in the top four. Or um, instead, you um, run one of the seven districts. And Cambridge is unique. Cambridge uses verbal vote proportional representation. So you rank the candidates. And uh, this is used in like Malta and Ireland and Northern Ireland and various other places. But you rank the candidates and the candidate with the least, the, well, if a candidate has a threshold, 
a number of votes. And if, if you get in that threshold on the first count, then you, you're elected. And if you don't, um, then they drop the lowest candidate, the candidate with the least number of votes, and they reallocate those votes to the next candidate. Uh, and they keep doing that until they get nine. So it, it's, it, it has its pros and its cons. I know some people in, in uh, Cambridge would prefer um, districts, but you know, so many districts, it's just once you're in, you're in, and no one runs against you. At least this way, since it's citywide and proportional, you can have nine people running, but actually 18 or 20 candidates, which at least give the voters more choice. All right, so uh, be honest with yourself. Um, what time and responsibilities do you have? Um, and are you, are you prepared for the pressures of campaigning? Um, does your su partner support your run? Uh, you know, we have a candidate be announced who I shall not name, uh, who is running for independent for president, and apparently his wife doesn't support him. Um, having run for office in uh, 2002 and 2006, uh, your spouse uh, supports you um, or your significant other or whatever is really important. And, um, <clears throat> but you know, are you prepared for the impact on your work or family life? Now, I say that with the eye towards you're going to run a full campaign, you're going to knock on all the doors, you're going to do a great get out the vote effort, you're going to go to every single candidate forum, you're going to do it. You don't have to do that. Right? Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. So when you're preparing, you know, you need to understand your opponent's positions by looking at the website, and I know it's Point. Sorry, I first started writing this in the early 2010s. Uh, newspapers, uh, so few of them now. Uh, you know, look at your vote, their voting history if you can. Uh, look at past election results. Uh, understand how many votes you would need to win, and you can get the list of voters and the voting history from, uh, and as well as census data uh, from your city at your town clerk and elections division. All right, well, before I get to that, so let me just go back to this. So there's a lot of different types of campaigns. Um, there you can run with the aim to win. You could run with the aim of I, at least identifying voters. And that could be, and that can be as big or as small as you want to make it. It can be um, your, like for example, if you're running for state rep, there are, let's say, 10 precincts in, um, there's 10 precincts. You could decide, you know what, I want to be on the ballot, I will get, it's only 150 to get on the ballot. Um, but I can't, I, I'm, I'm running against as an incumbent who routinely has no one running against them for the last 10 years. And they've got, you know, $300,000 in the bank uh, to do whatever. Uh, and they're, you know, some, some position within a, a committee or some, some like committee chair or something. So they've got clout. <clears throat> so... But it's important for pirates to be there. Um, so what you could do in that scenario is you could say, you know what, I'm just going to do my best to get the campaign organized, but just simply aim to knock on doors in my precinct. Uh, or, you know, if you're more ambitious, the precincts around you. Or if you're less ambitious, you know, <clears throat> your neighborhood and more. If you're least ambitious, you know, maybe just <laughs> your neighborhood. But the point is, knock on the doors, go through the effort. You know, maybe it's, you really can only do 
uh, an hour a week or something like that, or you could do you know half a weekend or you know like part of a Saturday or whatever. Just take the time, get people out, and go and knock on doors, and that's completely acceptable. <coughs> um, say that's too much. Another choice you could do is get on the ballot because you don't want to do a write-in campaign. That's a fool's errand. Just get the signatures, get on the um, That could be you, that could be you and a couple of friends. It doesn't take a lot of effort. Um, and then you, you're on the ballot and then it's, all right, I'm not going to go knock on doors. But at least I'm going to get the name, my name out there, and I'm going to get the pirate party out there. So maybe that is then, um, there are candidate forums. So you show up to candidate forums. And you reach out to whatever local newspaper to introduce yourself to them. Um, <clears throat> and maybe you do a couple of standouts uh, with some friends holding up some signs. That is completely acceptable. Uh, there is no shame in that. As a matter of fact, I would encourage everyone to do that for the simple reason that so many offices have one person running. That is not democracy when only one person is running for an office. Right. What do we, what do we, <clears throat> you know, the, the Soviet Union or, I mean, Iraq. Iraq has more people running <laughs> For offices than we do in the United States. Um, so by all means, we should be out there um, getting on the you know getting on the ballot and doing some standouts, meeting with folks, um, going to candidate forums, things like that. But say even that is too much. You know, you're working three jobs and um, you've got a family that you have to take care of, and you know your 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 mother. Um, you're, you're taking care of your mother. You just strap. You just can't do it. Just get on the ballot. Be a paper candidate. Get on the ballot, and that's it. Then at least come election day, people will see it's not just demo. It's not just Democrat A, Republican B. It is a Democrat A and a pirate, or Republican B and a pirate. Right. Even even that is important. You know, in, in Somerville, we had a two person race um, twice between uh, a Democrat and a, and a pirate in, in Somerville and a Somerville state rep district. And we got over 10 percent of the vote. You know, when in a three way race, we got four percent of the vote and we didn't we put effort into it, but we didn't necessarily put a huge amount of effort into it. So it's important to do that. People, you know, like you look at these races and you look at the results afterwards and it's 95, per, you know, it's it, it's 90 percent of the people depended upon the split between Democrats and Republicans. It's like 90 percent of the people voted for the incumbent. And then 10 percent didn't vote. So give a choice to those 10 percent. Right. Just get on the ballot. Uh, okay, so, but still, if you don't, uh, you know, so I mentioned you know, there are various, you know, it, it could also be that you don't, like, you really want to run for Congress. Great. We need people running for Congress. Um, but that's too much. So, run for state rep, run for state senate, run for sheriff, um, <clears throat> or, you know, run instead in your town election or your city election or something like that. But there's other things you can do. You know, you can start your local party chapter. You can volunteer on a local board or commission. You can start an issue campaign uh, or a local newsletter. Um, so that's, there's more to this all around talk, but I specifically wanted to focus on why people should run. Um, we have other videos about getting on the ballot, identifying voters, turning them out on election day, supporting volunteers, fundraising, things like that. 
we've got those videos and we will have our conference in, Mar in January, probably, uh, which will be before nomination papers are due. Uh, and we'll go over, uh, you know, and, and we'll kind of go over that process as well. But just wanted to be able to focus on what, um, what people can do short of aiming to win. So with that, um, I'm just going to open it up to questions. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> because my voice is just really tired at this point. Yeah, I, I gotta get some water. Things really come to mind for me right now. A lot of my focus has been outside of politics directly. Because you know, I'm a big believer in the idea that um, you know, if you want to change how politics works, you need to, you know, influence people and in how they think. Uh, which, you know, I'm not a fan of where I learned that from, but <laughs> yeah. I, I get the idea of, you know, running a candidate just so that to build awareness. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, does anyone online have any questions? All right, well, um, so with that, uh, I guess when folks watch this on YouTube, we'll put a link in about the uh, other talks that we have about running for office. So, um, and I need to get some water. So do you want to queue up, Greg? Sure, and uh, <clears throat> So are you, so you're connected, so you can share your screen. Uh, can I share through the app here, or do I connect to the HDMI? Um, I would say, um, I think HDMI would work better for me if possible. So I can use the whole, the whole split screen with the notes. So I would say you can connect to, just, yeah. So you can go and connect to, um, HDMI. <clears throat> and it'll appear there. And if you can also, sh I'll set it up so that I share it. And then we'll hopefully get it one or two ways. So let me stop. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <clears throat> if you want to go and share your screen. I'm still getting your desktop. So no. Oh, wait, no, that's. Never mind. Okay, I, I see. Um, see the three buttons down below, the one on the right in the center. Um, Okay. Or is it this one? Minimize press. No, no, let me. Maybe I need to authorize you to have a share. Yeah. I'll make you presenter. There you go. Now you can share. <clears throat> Okay, shall I get started? Yeah, you can do it. Okay, so uh, today I want to talk about uh, creating a more distributed and fair tech industry. 
this has been something that's been a pet project of mine since 2018. Uh, I'm currently on my second attempt, um, but you know, resources are tight, so it's, it's a slow moving process. Um, this isn't directly related to politics, but I see a lot of um, a lot of ties between um, what is going on in the tech industry and what is going on in politics. Uh, if any of you are familiar with Cambridge Analytica and uh, their influence in the 2016 election, that was a big wake-up call for me. Um, and you know, in general, I've just been spending a lot of time trying to get a different perspective of the industry that I've been working in. So, a uh, brief inter introduction. Uh, my name is Gregory Boyce. Um, I'm currently the director of technology for the workshop, which is a uh, it is the largest makerspace, industrial makerspace on the East Coast. Uh, it's based out in uh, Leicester, Massachusetts, which, if you're not familiar, it is uh, just outside of Worcester. Um, I'm also the owner of Small Tech LLC, uh, and my goal with Small Tech is to build this distributed technology that I'm talking about. Uh, a lot of it is in partnership with the workshop, but it's not exclusively uh, related to the workshop. Um, I have 25 years of experience working with uh, Linux security and complex distributed systems. Um, I spent most of that time at a single large uh, company that was uh, originally an MIT startup and it went on to become a billion dollar company. Um, over that time, you know, I started off in operations, managing this deployed network of uh, that, well, hundreds and then thousands and then hundreds of thousands of machines. Um, and from there, I moved on to information where I learned how to view things through uh, a much more security and, uh, and mindset. Um, in the end there, I ended leading uh, engineering teams. Uh, so leadership has always been a big part of what I do, either um, not always through direct reports, sometimes just through, you know, leading through action. Um, so during that time, I participated in design, security, and operations of this distributed network. Uh, I learned how to examine complex systems and uh, learned how to achieve positive change within an organization. Um, I also learned things about internal bureaucracy and politics. Uh, you know, these are problems that exist outside of, of business as well. But you know, I, I came uh, came to the impact of political stagnation. Let's say, you know, as long as everyone's thinking in a particular way, the organization's going to continue to function in a particular way. It's very difficult to achieve change. Often, the change that comes is going to be um, the result of somebody essentially subverting that political nature. You know, not playing the same game looking to you know, solve problems directly as opposed to influencing uh, an organization. Um, working in the same company for about 20 years, um, I had a view of an organization as almost family or friends. You know, this, is, this was my community. You know, the people that I was working with attended my wedding. You know, this, this is the sort of organization that I was experiencing. Um, in the end, I came to discover that it was a dysfunctional organization at best. Uh, and I'm not trying to pick on the company I was working for. It's just the top-down nature of working in a corporate environment. You know, you, you're, the people immediately around you that you're working with on a regular basis, these are your peers, these are your friends, these are the people that you, would, that you do the work for. And then there's the people that you actually work for and their priorities, which, you know, uh, according to publicly traded companies, uh, they are required to maximize shareholder value. It is a legal requirement. They have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders, and they are required to behave in a way that works in the best interest of the people who are focused on money. That's just the way it is. Um, what I came to realize by the end of my, my that part of my career is that that is always a choice for the individual, though you don't have to continue working in that sort of environment. There are other ways to work. They are just maybe not as lucrative. Um, so the other thing I learned was the power of opportunity. You know, I worked with people from MIT. I worked with people from Harvard. I worked from people from other major uh, colleges, advanced degrees. You know, I, we had someone on the help desk who had a PhD in uh, chemistry. He eventually went on to be an executive in the company. It's all, you know, what you're able to get in, what value you're able to provide, and whether or not people recognize you. 
Um, so I was working with all of those people, but I came in with a high school. You know, I grew up in Massachusetts. Most of my coworkers didn't. They came here for schooling. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. You know, the tech industry around Boston in the late 90s, often they were hiring warm bodies. So, you know, if you can get your foot in the door, then you have the opportunity to gain experience because it's through these sort of opportunities that you're presented that you actually can learn the skills and, and you know, build yourself at, as, as um, uh, an expert in something. So that's what I saw happening uh, from my personal experience. But the other thing I saw happening was a shift in the, in, in the industry where, you know, those sort of opportunities weren't so available anymore. You know, getting your foot in the door without a degree has become a lot harder. It's often cheaper to import a workforce from other places in the com country or from other places in the world than it is to just try to, you know, give opportunities to the people who are already around you. So that's, that's kind of what I was uh, concerned about when I initially left. So 2018, um, I left that job. I decided to focus on problems I saw within the industry. I decided to focus on problems I saw in the country. Um, I had spent a significant percentage of my life, basically half of my life, working within the same environment, often around the same people. I was very much in a bubble. So I spent the first year escaping that bubble. Um, I talked to people I wouldn't be exposed to normally, you know, working class people around me. Um, I spent a bunch of time on Twitter talking to Trump supporters of all things, trying to, you know, convince people of what they were missing. I came to discover it's really hard to convince people that they're missing something, but you can convince yourself that you're missing something. You know, you can learn from them and build a wor wider worldview that doesn't necessarily negate what you already know, but that adds to it. There's always more that you haven't learned yet. Um, I spent that year listening to a lot of audiobooks with a heavy focus on philosophy and politics, um, you know, kind of regaining what I might have learned at college if I had gone down that path. Um, I paid close attention to the words and actions of politicians. You know, part of the reason I quit is uh, the Trump administration. I had, I saw fascism, you know, um, and people didn't see it and I didn't know why. Um, and I was trying, trying to watch what they were doing so that I would be aware. I uh, opened my mind to new perspectives while continuing to see the problems I had been watching from within the industry. I now saw additional problems as well. Um, over time, a different picture emerged for me uh, as I saw the product of my industry from the perspective of the rest of society uh, instead of someone whose paycheck depended on continuing to see things the same way. I, I saw a different picture and it is a picture that did, I did not like. Um, this next slide hurts me. <laughs> So it, it talks about anywhere from 70 to 90% of corporate servers that are sent to uh, said to be using Linux as an operating system. Uh, about 70% of most uh, corporate enterprise uh, software stacks are open source software, not just Linux, but you know the, the programming language, all of the stuff that comes with open source, a lot of that is open source. That means that open source software has been enabling a lot of our, our problems, you know, a lot of our problems with money, a lot of our problems with, you know, power, um, you know, and it's not the technology. The technology is not the problem. The technology is a tool. The problem is the sets of the people who are using the technology, you know, not necessarily the engineers, but the people who are paying the engineers, you know, they are focused on, in most cases, short term profitability. And you know, we can see the longer term results, some planned, some unplanned. So uh, a focus on automation and efficiency removed other people's jobs, uh, excluding them from benefits of economic booms. Tools for, for enabling remote workforces made uh, the process of leveraging a cheaper workforce easier. So you know, we saw when COVID hit, you know, a lot of people started working remotely. I actually saw as salaries started booming in some of the biggest tech companies. The companies uh, achieved massive uh, profit margins. And just a year later, or two years, depending on you know where you're looking from, 
They started laying off hundreds of thousands of people. This is not the mindset of an organization that cares about stakeholders other than the investors. And that's, that's a problem. So the problem here, as I see it, is that tech is inheriting the problems of society itself. So, you know, I think that we can probably agree that society is currently broken, or our country is broken in some ways. I mean, people here, you know, you're looking to a party other than the two main parties to achieve change. You know, obviously, you, you see things that the parties are missing, and you want to bring a new perspective. Um, I see a lot of problems in the country, but I see a lot of them is existing outside of politics. You know, um, politics is being viewed as the solution. When I look at the actual problems themselves, I don't see how politics can actually solve them. You know, um, we have a mindset in, in this country, an idea that, that everyone in the country should be working full time. We also have a mindset in this country that we need to be developing tools so that we can do as much as possible with as few humans as possible. So, you know, this, the, the combination of these two ideas are going to require exponential in how much we do in a world of fixed resources. You know, there's just this inherent insanity in how we think about work, how we think about money, how we think about so many different, different things that impact our lives on a daily basis. Um, I see a lot of people trying to use political as a means of fixing the issue. Um, I see people choosing champions instead of looking at the underlying issues. You know, you, you're at, people are asking themselves, you know, is this party going to solve it or is this party going to solve it? And then I look at the actions of the parties and they're not interested in solving them. You know, do we want to invest a whole bunch of money into making industry stronger, knowing what industry is doing with that? Or do we want to cut their taxes in order to hurt the government? Well, what we end up with is a, co is a combination of the two of them. You know, we put a bunch of money into these corporations and then we cut their taxes. That does not help us. You know, when it comes down to it, what is shaping the world around us isn't the money, it isn't the corporations, it's what we're doing. It's the activity that we're taking. And the activity we're doing is we're working for the rich and we're fighting over top-down power. And we ended up in a, in a country that's authoritarian. <laughs> like it's, It has to do with the character of the people and the actions that they're taking in this in this country. Looking to fight for top-down power, you're going to elect people who are authoritarians because you yourself have an authoritarian mindset. You know, from my perspective, there's a lot we as individuals can do in order to solve these problems, but it requires our active participation in understanding the problems and working on solutions. So we, we have a biased understanding of money, you know, and if you look back to a lot of religions, philosophers, all of these different things, they, they warn about the problems with a focus on money. You see the same problems through the eyes of an economist, you can just, you know, look at what's happening around us. But it's, you know, it's that personal understanding here. So money, money is a means to an end. Money isn't wealth. For the perspective of people, um, I mean things like financial stability, you know, having a home, being safe, uh, an opportunity for meaningful contribution to something larger than yourself. Um, wealth can be a striving, a thriving community around you. A focus. Oops, sorry. A focus on money encourages people to move where the expenses are higher. You need money 
to you need more money to achieve the same level of actual wealth in an area with a larger with a higher cost of living than you do in an area with a smaller cost of living. One of the side effects I've seen of the enabling of a remote workforce is the spreading of a group of people who currently make more money into communities where that is now driving up their cost of living. Um, so back in 2019, I relocated. I moved, uh, so I worked in Cambridge here for, well, just outside here for uh, about 20 years in a bunch of different towns in the area. I, I lived in Newton most recently uh, before moving to Worcester. Um, I moved to Worcester because it was a place where things were less expensive. You know, I don't have to sell my time wholesale in order to just achieve an existence. Since then, the cost of living has jacked up dramatically. You know, I, I, I've met people who've been living there for years outside of, outside of Worcester, and they've been talking about how, um, you know, these small towns that they grew up in are becoming cottage communities for Boston. You know, this is where people have gone to enjoy their time now that they are not living directly in the city anymore. That's, you know, that is a positive for the people that move there. It's not a positive for the people who are now competing with a lot more wealth in order to buy the same properties. Um, you know, and even the competition for properties, even if you're not moving, you're already established, the, house, the um, estimated cost of your property is increasing and you're gonna see higher taxes. So you're gonna have to work more even to just stay in the same place. Now, it's true that money is going to be involved in any solutions to our problems, but the money itself is generally a means to an end. You know, the money pays someone a salary so that workers can use their skilled labor. The money buys supplies. You know, it, it pays for your expenses, but the cost of those expenses is variable. You know, you can get donated things instead of, uh, instead of purchasing. You can have volunteers instead of employees. There are that we can achieve the same goals for less money, but the focus being centered on money ends up being a barrier to entry. If you can't get enough money to start, then you're never going to make any progress. So this is important. This is a quote from Lawrence Lessig uh, from uh, January 1st, 2000. Ours is the age of cyberspace. It too has a regulator. This regulator too threatens liberty. But so obsessed with me are we with the idea that liberty is freedom from government that we don't even see the regulations in this new space. We therefore don't see the threat to liberty that this regulation presents. This was written in a piece he calls Code is Law. Because code defines what you can and cannot do vulnerabilities, you can find exploits, you can find ways to bypass the intentions of the code. But the code, regardless of, say, your rights, the code is going to require that you do what the code says you're going to do. So Meta and, Glo and Google are two global You know, I'm sure they attempt to follow federal, state, and local laws. Um, but they regularly enforce policies that impact members of the community all over the world. People become dependent on tech platforms, either for their business or just their personal lives. And the corporations that own the platform can arbitrarily make decisions that impact their livelihood at any time. Most of these platforms have click-through licenses where they set the rules and they can change the rules arbitrarily at any point. You as an individual have very little influence over, over those rules, unless you happen to know the right person are not going to make a meaningful impact. Regulation could potentially make a meaningful impact, but given that that politics is currently a no holds barred fight for top down power that depends on the money from these corporations, it doesn't seem like a likely one to me. So, example that has been interesting to watch over the past few years. Um, back during the Trump administration, I watched as government agencies, politicians, and you know, whoever else that were supposed to provide checks and balances on corrupt power failed. It got to January 6th. We had an attack on, on 
um, on the Capitol building. And it seemed as though no one was willing to take any action to stop it. There was one organization that was willing to take some sort of action. Twitter. They took a stand against Donald Trump and blocked him from his, their platform in order to uh, in order to prevent him from inciting more violence. That, how much power did, did that platform have? And you can look at what happened as a result. There was a massive political backlash from the same people who abused political power. The, the people that you know, go by the name Freedom Caucus and that sort of thing, they, they, saw, they saw the attempt to stifle the President of the United States as an attack on his rights and an overstep from this organization, which I can understand. The next result is that the world's richest man decided to borrow money from whoever would lend it to him in order to put himself in a position where he can be the person that dictated the rules of that organization. Our policy choices for a private corporation so there's no democratic process involved. You know, corporations are centered in top-down power. The, I'm not saying this is illegal. I'm not saying this should be illegal. I am saying that it is not in the best interest of us as individuals to participate in the same way that we've been participating. It gives all of the powers in a top-down way to the same people who buy influence within politics. You know, we spend billions of dollars on elections at this point. How much of that money goes into ad campaigns with Facebook and Twitter and, you know, what other, uh, other platforms are out there? So this is a diff that I've been watching for a while. So I was an early investor in something called Diaspora, which was uh, an early peer-to-peer -peer social network. That technology has progressed. You know, the, the, the term that gets used for it these days is the Fediverse. So the Fediverse is a collection of services that operate in a decentralized manner. So instead of having you know, a central organization that controls all of the rules, there's a soft, piece of software that can be installed that provides you with the similar functionality uh, on a local level. So there's a service called Mastodon. It is very Twitter-like. You can run your own instance, or you can join an existing instance. But these instances can talk to each other. You know, so an individual has the freedom to choose which instance that they're, gonna, they're going to be a member of. The instances have the ability to implement their own policies and enforce those policies on the users. If a user doesn't like the way you have the option of going to a different instance, so you can even run an instance yourself. And then separately, all of the instances can work together in order to determine rules between them. A given instance can block another instance if it is supporting anti-Semitism. You can't tell people over there to do it, but you can say that none of us are going to hear it from you. I'm not a fan of unchecked speech. Like, I would much rather engage in a conversation than to enforce, but if there needs to be enforcement at some don't want it to be in the hands of centralized organizations that lack the ability and willingness to actually provide any sort of meaningful control. So I like the idea of software in service as opposed to software as a service. You know, my goal for is we're going to build digital infrastructure for local commerce. What that means for me is community clouds. So you know, we can start with a base of computing hardware that we run within the community. The nice thing about this is it teaches a skill set and gives people an opportunity to learn how to manage a private cloud, as opposed to, you know, versus to Amazon or everyone else versus to Google, and Google chooses who or what, you know, who, who is going to be operating this thing. In the, my initial thought was, you know, run it with existing hardware. You can actually buy enterprise hardware fairly cheap if it's been retired uh, from use. Um, there's also some cheap offer, uh, offerings for, for running this sort of thing. Now, what runs on top of this community cloud are things like Fediverse services. You can run Mastodon instances. You can run PixelFed, which is an Instagram-like service. You know, there's 
which is a Facebook-like service. You can run online commerce platforms in order to connect the local businesses together. So that instead of uh, everyone using Amazon as your sales platform, you can now have community platforms that connect local businesses as opposed to opening up to a global market where it becomes cheaper to buy something from China than it does to have someone down the street build it. So the core concept here, uh, oh. So the, the core concept is a management of services for the community. You can offer, you know, you can run this stuff on existing public clouds. Like I said, I see a lot of benefits to running private clouds within the community. Um, Nextcloud offers, so I mentioned Mastodon. Nextcloud offers contact and file synchronization. We have Moodle, which offers online uh, online learning programs, so that you can help give people the opportunity to learn skills within the community. My goal for this would not be that small tech operates this for the country. My goal would be that small tech operates this for Worcester. I could partner with someone in Cambridge if you want to run a Cambridge instance. Someone in New York can run a New York instance. It's individual communities building local economies and then sharing the tools with other communities such that we can you know, collectively work together. You know, this is this old idea that we don't hear so much anymore. You know, think global, act local. In my mind, local economies are horizontally scalable. Global economies just end up shifting money to key areas, and everyone else is dealing with a, a shortage, shortage of um, money and a shortage of engineering. You know, if you're a brilliant guy, small brilliant guy or girl, or if you grow up in one of these communities where there's not much opportunity, you're probably going to try to get a degree, you're going to move to a place with a college, and you're probably going to get a job there. You know, we want to avoid the brain drain. We don't want to put all the smart people into a single location and teach them this way of living that excludes everyone else. So, my initial, my initial attempt here was, you know, 2019, I moved to, I opened up a little community, a little shop. My goal was to build a community space where people can come in and learn technology. I'll work, you know, connect with the local businesses, and I'll figure out, you know, how to build what they need and figure out how to move forward from there. Timing was not great. <laughs> I was supposed to open in spring 2020. Instead, that all went away, and I got a, uh, another job that lasted me a few years. This is take two. Uh, phase two with take two with take two. Sorry, phase one for take two is partnering with makerspaces. So, as I mentioned, I'm the director of technology for um, for Workshop out in Leicester. Uh, we have with a lot of the other makerspaces uh, in Massachusetts, and you know these are ideas that can spread to makerspaces across the country. It seems like the perfect place to start this process, but eventually, I would want either more makerspaces and more communities, or to decouple from makerspaces entirely. Because a lot of this stuff, you know, it can benefit from a makerspace, but it's not really about makerspaces. It's about building tools to enable communities. And that is it. Any questions? Um, thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Um, one of the efforts that I've been part of, let me sit over here, sorry. <laughs> be sure to be in the zone of the microphone, mm -hmm. um, is mesh networking. Uh, so there's mass mesh that has set up a meshing system using Raspberry Pis and commodity uh, radios such that the Raspberry Pis take the data that comes from the, from the Wi-Fi radio, um, encrypt it, and stick it on a network called Yggdrasil, which exists on top of the internet. It's kind of IPv6 addressing on top of the internet, mm -hmm. where everything is is end-to-end. -end well, everything is peer-to-peer -peer encrypted. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so that that's had a number of good successes. Uh, and one of the things that we had thought about was creating applications that existed within the Drizzle, this network on top of the internet, um, that people could get to as a way of encouraging them to connect to that network that <clears throat> looks at privacy and enables security um, of the data that you send out of the box yeah. instead of just I go I you know use my web browser it goes somewhere meanwhile my ISP is inserting ads into what I'm seeing because it's not in action. Um, so how could that be, do you, do you think that's an effort that could be integrated into what you're trying to do? I think, I think it would. Um, so one of, one of my goals was to, to look at community fiber as well. Uh, so I, Worcester, there's a uh, town, Shrewsbury, which is where my kids live. And they actually have community fiber that's run by the local power company. So they just have you know, a local utility that provides all that services. Um, in Worcester, so my first attempt, you know, I, I got that office. Uh, part of the getting that office is I paid extra for enter, and I bought uh, Ubiquity network gear that allowed a mesh offering. And I was planning on expanding out wireless from there. Um, so I definitely think building, um, you know, building some sort of community-based ISP would really help. The, the private space is an interesting idea. So initially, I was thinking, you know, if you're if you're building a community um, community fiber network, so it's really just a local network. You don't have to build an overlay on top of that. You know, there's a mindset shift of, you know, let's build services uh, available within that network and not outside of that network, but you don't need a separate overlay. But, you know, that, there's a huge barrier to entry to starting up a new ISP. So I can totally see, you know, benefit in having that sort of private community space where, you know, it's only available to members of the community. It's kind of the whole walled garden thing, but for, you know, people and not for profitability. <laughs> and literally, it's a wall, a, a virtual wall around your city. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a big part of it is, you know, corporations are security people. They have this security mindset of, you know, how to protect your assets. But society, we don't. You know, we've got the we've got the CSA, the CIA, and the NSA. You know, thinking about national security and electronic uh, level. But you know, one of the things from them was counterproductive in my mind. Um, you know, they were they were hoarding vulner uh, exploits for vulnerabilities as opposed to making sure that the vulnerabilities are patched so that people are safe. You know, I think that I think that communities having a security mindset around we protect ourselves from outsiders to the community that aren't necessarily outsiders of the country, but just you know people who don't have our best intentions at heart. You know, um, exploitative businesses, for example. There's a lot of those. <sighs> you know. I mean, the last 50 years have been corporations attempting to privatize profits and socialize risk over and over. And, you know, we see it where they gather data on us and then they get hacked yeah. or they have poor security and they let people get access to the data. Um, but we don't have a privacy law, so... Even, even with the privacy law, it's not going to prevent... Exploitation, you know, it, it'll it it potentially have bigger gathering. consequences. It could minimize gathering. It could say, you know, this information, you you need like a really high level to gather this particular information. Yeah, there is and there is opt in and stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, there is definitely a mindset of data hoarding that I've seen in the industry, um, where you know you don't even necessarily know what data you have. Um, last year, 
I think it was. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Mudge or not. Uh, so, member of uh, former member of Loft uh, Security, ha ha the, the local security group. Mm -hmm. um, he went on to he worked in the government for a while, and then he went on and became the head of security for Twitter. Last year, he was uh, talking to Congress about, among other things, the sheer amount of data that Twitter has with almost no access controls on it. Any engineer can access any of the data, and they don't even know what's in it. And they don't even know that someone who's accessing it. Yes, yeah. and there have been multiple foreign agents found within the company. There was uh, right. there was yeah, an agent Saudi for Arabia. Saudi Arabia working at the company, and who knows what they accessed. Right. There's probably no logs that tell you what what they accessed, uh, and certainly no protections to prevent them from accessing it. So these. The mindset when when people are running these organizations, and the organizations are very much centralized. You know, it is let's put everything under one control. I don't I don't want to keep trusting that. I would much rather move to new distributed alternatives where you know you have control over over your data than you would otherwise. But the problem with that is that most of these platforms are useless without users. Like, if you move yourself, you're going to be talking to yourself. <laughs> if everyone moves, we can talk with each other. So, you know, you need to have that shift in uh, of the people, you know? And that's not something that government is going to come in and tell us to do. You know, we don't need to be told to do this. In fact, they will not tell us to do this because it'll impact adversely the things that give them power. Into the choir. Yeah. <laughs> so how? Um, so I know in Boston now there's Artisans Asylum. Yep. I know in Lowell there's there was um, I think it's still there. I haven't been up there in a while. Uh, there's a makerspace. Mm -hmm. So the makerspace that you're involved in, uh, what is available for people to to do? So uh, there's they do regularly do classes on woodworking. Uh, metal, metal. They have a working metal shop. They were working, you know, wood shop there. Um, they've got working blacksmiths there. Uh, and those are some of the more classes. Uh, the teachers there are re really great. Um, and they also have, uh, I think, it was four four million dollars worth of high end equipment, including like laser cutters and all sorts of stuff. So, uh, in order to use any of that, you need to be certified. You need like to the process they need to be comfortable that you know how to use the system mm -hmm. but from there you know you have access to that equipment so someone someone who already has or someone who's looking to learn the skills in some cases we don't have the people to train on them yet mm -hmm. um, I think I think for most of it we do the, the 3d printing lab I have some learning to do before I can really help people like I know how to print something but I'm not going to create a design which is probably yeah. more interesting than just printing something for six hours right, right. Um, so, you know, there, there's, my goal for the makerspace is to turn it into a place where people can come in order to make money. You know, if, if to build a product and offer it for sale, here's a place you can come and just rent the equipment instead of having to buy it yourself or borrow the equipment, you know, depending on, depending on what it is, you know, you can come in and you can find people to work with. You know, who'd be interested in helping you? You could potentially hire someone. You could potentially be hired by someone in order to share your skills. Um, you know, it's very much. They are currently very much centered around create, making themselves into a teaching place. Um, but you know, the way industry is going, I really, I think people are going to need the ability to make extra money, especially if layoffs continue. That sort of thing. Um, and they're not even the only uh, makerspace in the Worcester area. Um, there's also uh, Technicopia, I think, is in Worcester. There's two that I always get mixed up. There's, uh, in Orange, Massachusetts, there is uh, one as well. I think uh, there's one in Worcester itself. Okay. Yeah, so that, I believe, is Technicopia. Okay. Yeah, I haven't actually been there in person yet, but um, I, I, need to, I need to do that. I need to visit a few more places. Ooh. Okay.
that all I have. Thank you very any much. Any, any questions from folks online? All right then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, let's see. Just going to So I'm just going to read, since we don't really have a projection for um, for this, I'm going to adjust the camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so our last topic is on planning for 2024, planning for the winter. Um, I mean, I've already mentioned the idea of um, running candidates, uh, I would say even sometime after 2016 uh, with the whole Trump administration that took a bit of effort out and then you had the pandemic. But uh, the problems persist and uh, <clears throat> there are just more problems. So <laughs> pirates are still needed. Um, so one aspect of that is, of course, training people um, and then encouraging people to run. Um, you you said you know you've gone out you've talked with people you've engaged with trump supporters what what are your thoughts in terms of but what what are, what are your thoughts in terms of that endeavor do you have any suggestions in ter in terms of going out and engaging with people yes i think it's worthwhile um i think that you need to go out there with an open mind, though, because a lot of us are in bubbles, you know, and it's hard to see your own bias until you're confronted with it. And it's very easy to get defensive and angry when someone asks what you think, you know. So it's not it's not easy. And if you aren't able to do it without, you know, managing that <laughs> those reactions, you can make things worse rather than better. Um, I probably did that a lot when I first got started, you know, but 
I was engaging in a dumpster fire online. So <laughs> <laughs> it's still a dumpster fire. <laughs> it, it, it just is. just the just the calls for like genocide in Gaza is just but you know, and then you look at Nagorno Karabakh and there's Ukraine. I mean just genocide galore. <laughs> Yes, you know, like it's easy to get caught up in the idea of sides when in reality it's just individuals. You know, like you can you can classify someone in a group and you know maybe they sort of fit, but the group itself is generally divided too. You know, it's it's very so much black and white thinking drives so much of this. You know, like Democrats are, I heard leading up to the 2020 election, I heard so many people talking about how, you know, vote for anyone who's blue, you know, right. like, because you're voting against evil. Right. You know, but the Republicans, when I say Republicans here, I mean the people, the people aren't all evil. Like there's some people I would fit into that category, but generally they're not, you know, they see a problem with the Democrats, which in a lot of cases are valid. And they are voting for what they think is the lesser evil. And if when you have people on both sides voting for lesser evils, you're still going to end up with evil. <laughs> so, you know, like recognizing that there's no group that's good here and it all comes down to, you know, the people and what they are actively doing. Like, it's, it's a lot less black and white. It's so much gray. You know, I would much rather, you know, see someone that votes for Trump, but, you know, within their life are a positive impact in their community, because, you know, I can get through to someone like that. You know, if when you deal with a zealot, there's no getting through, you know, you can't you can't convince someone of something that they don't already see unless they're open to it, which is why, you know, politics kind of. I have trouble seeing a solution there, but I can see the solution triggering a change there. I think, I mean, I, I you know, I, I run for office. I was in the Green Party uh, from 96 to you know, 2008 or so, to 2010. Um, I think there are some people people will listen to but that may not be you or me, right? But it's yeah. like they, they, yeah, that's all right. I'm mean, just like, I could talk with someone and they're just, they're just not going to live, look, you know, it's like, you're a white guy in the city who works in tech. You don't know my experience, right? But maybe there's somewhere, someone else you can reach out to who is willing to listen to you. And if you get them, maybe they're the one or they're the one who knows the one who will reach out to other folks. And yeah. so the, the effort is like, I, I remember um, sometimes you just got to cut your losses. So for example, we we're gathering signatures for um, uh, one of our candidates, uh, Nolani. And this guy, wanted to get into an argument about copyright because his wife writes mm -hmm. and he sees that oh if she doesn't get her life of the author plus 70 you know copyright terms then that's a big effect on her income and it's kind of like yeah. well probably not because literally when you're dead no one's gonna get you know like maybe your kids will get it maybe the book will be used who knows but at some point, you were just trying to gather signatures. And so at some point, it's like, I, I can't talk to you. I'm like, I, I will agree to disagree. I'm going to move on and talk to this person who might be willing to sign my nominate, sign Nolani's nomination paper, not you. But it's a waste of my time. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is almost the person that would have the biggest impact if you can convince them though. Agreed. And I think that I think that the important thing there would be to, you know, differentiate between that that small level impact. You know, it's very easy to defend the rights of a single author. But it's a very different picture when you look at how, you know, the fact that copyright is 
70 years plus the life of the of the content creator and the fact that you know the large part of the reason why that's the case is because of disney who has gone <laughs> on to buy up the bulk of you know pop culture like that's a very clear counter case to you know why this is a destructive why this can be a thing um you know, and maybe the answer is, you know, different rules for corporations versus individual humans, you know. Um, but I, I do tend to agree that 70 years past the death of the content creator is probably a bit long and unnecessary for anyone other than a giant corporation looking to protect their, uh, you know, catalog. Um, although that, that goes... I mean, in this particular case, that was his issue. And so he's like, he could have supported us on other stuff, but not that. And, I, you know, I can understand that, um, even if I disagree. Mm -hmm. um, but so as a candidate, it's, you know, your time is important. Other people, everyone's time is important. Right. But, you know, knowing where to spend your effort to whether that's, hey, I'm going to reach out to the 18 to 24 year olds because they're more receptive to listening to me than, you know, someone who's 55 or, yeah. or higher. You know, maybe that's that's the way you know, that may be one way to to do that. Of course, the 55 year old is probably more likely to vote than the 18 year old. But that doesn't, you know, you can still get 18 year olds who are, they're damn well going to vote. Um, whereas 55s are like, eh. <laughs> same old, same old. Yeah. I, I do get worried sometimes when people adopt strategies that are very results driven. Because there's a lot of learning that is done when you're engaging in that conversation, you mm -hmm. know, and like learning other people's perspectives requires that that challenge. Like you can if you get, you know, a hundred people who disagree with you and you manage to, you know, like convince ten of them. That might have a, a long, a better long-term impact than, than you know convincing the the you know hundred people who agree with you to vote. You know, it might the, the second one may help more with the given election, but the long term longer term impact, you know, the first group may be more impactful. But the problem, the the dynamic that I can see with that is if people don't see that their efforts are bearing fruit where say they're measuring it by the number of votes they get or the number of people they identify as supporters so then you could spend that effort on those 10 people but if i could spend an effort on ident the same amount of time identifying 100 people who are more aligned with me rather than convincing 10 people who aren't aligned with me that's that that's a better base to build on potentially because we have 100 people who could turn into volunteers who could turn into people with signs door knocking or even just doing stuff on off years whereas the 10 people and maybe that'll be the same but i'd rather have 100 people than 10. yeah that, i mean that makes that makes perfect sense my my only concern is like what i witnessed with other political parties sure you know when the party platform becomes the collection of all the things that people want right not because they make sense together but because they want to get as many people to vote for them as possible you know um sometimes the right thing is unpopular and you know if you 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 might get better results if you avoid it but you know people are gonna not be happy about it when you spring them on in the last minute you know <laughs> Well, but I mean, our system is, you know, for the legislature, for the House, is 160 individual first past the post, you know, ostensibly a majority, but really plurality wins. Um, we're not Germany where you could get 5% of the people and have representation within the Bundestag. Um, And that's, that's like Cambridge, I feel like that would be a good possibility where you could focus on a small number of people or smaller number of people, but you still also have a search space to try and find them. And it's not like, you know, there still seems to be an effort, I guess. Yeah. So it's like, do you get the low hanging fruit of people who are a lot 
happy with you and then at least you have that as a base and you can kind of reach out to other and either convince them or talk with them or engage with them like uh, over an iterative process i feel like that's kind of better than if you just put you you focus on trying to convince people who are harder to convince <laughs> I, I I hear you. Um, you know, it's part of why I'm not looking to politics for a solution. I'm looking sure. for direct action. You Absolutely, know, like people uh, finding ways to make change within their life. And you know, the more that that mindset spreads, I think the easier it'll be to influence politics. Um, yeah, because you know, the thing that makes the most sense if you're trying to get votes is often counter to what makes sense if you're trying to actually change. I mean, you get someone elected, well, now you're the minority representation within a governing body. Right. You know, you, you could be the next Bernie Sanders. You know, I, I have a lot of respect for the, for the man, but his, in terms of actual, like, legislative influence, it's just not there, you know, because he votes his heart and then he's like the one person voting on the opposite side of, of issues. Um, where, you know, if instead, you know, like in order to start something like this, where, you know, we're, we have a new company, something new, you know, I don't need hundreds of people, you know, I need the right small set of people, you know, and with, with a vision that can work and then, you know, just work together to achieve it, um, you know, people who make that and are able to make that sort of positive change through their action, like that's people want to look to for leadership, you know, and that point, you know, maybe politics makes sense, but, you know, trying to change the character of politics by focusing on votes, it just, it seems like you mentioned Sisyphus, you know, <laughs> that's what it feels like to me. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I use the Sisyphus analogy because you're trying to sidestep that. Because if, you're, if your viewpoint is, I want to win and that's my only objective, then you are Sisyphus because odd, odds are you have just voter inertia. You've got, you've got voter inertia against you. You've got money against you. You've got volunteers against you because they just have more and they can have an active... Democrat or Republican yep. town committee or city committee or something like that. So they can get more support. Um, whereas, you know, looking at, you know, as you said, you know, if, it's, if you just wander your neighborhood and meet people, you're going to get some set of people who are like, yeah, sure, I'll support you. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you do that, okay, this year it's 10 people. And then, you know, either you or someone you help runs in two years and maybe that's 100 people and then you know the two years after that that's 400 people or you know it's like that kind of building upon it so in some ways i think we are like you know starting small and, and getting folks um but it's you know in some ways a search problem and in some ways a convince people problem <laughs> so, um But at this point, we're in a getting people to make the step to be candidates problem, um, which is why setting the bar low of, yeah, sure, just be a paper candidate yeah. is, is a useful one. Just to be on the ballot is an accomplishment. Um, and thinking, thinking about that from the standpoint of the slide deck, we could focus on here is the minimum you can do. Mm -hmm. and then get to the here's the maximum you can do uh, or something um, <clears throat> so in terms of because of the pandemic have more people wanting to use the local makerspace or the the effort that you've been putting into like now that you kind of you're starting it up all right do you feel like that's more of a more people are interested? I, I feel like more people 
to get interested in the maker space. Uh, I wasn't involved before the pandemic though, so it's hard for me to you know compare. Uh, I don't know if it's related to that at all. <laughs> um, uh, I think that you know the economic problems are probably driving some of it at least. You know, as cost of living is going up, people need to find new ways to make money. Right. So you know, learning new skills is is a, a useful thing for them. Um, you know, having access to the machinery is a useful thing. You know, having access to the skilled people around you. You know, all of these help when you're trying to navigate uh, an economic downturn. Um, COVID probably had some amount of impact. I know it, it certainly adversely impacted workshop. You know, they almost went under. They are constantly on the verge of <laughs> going under. Mm -hmm. they, they definitely could use some investment. Um, you know, they've been able to get it as time goes on, but it's, you know, it's just difficult, especially as my money gets tighter in general. Right. And, you know, people may, may be able to throw you some money and not use the services, but the people who will throw you more money are the people who use the, the device, the machines and stuff there as well. Um, yeah, I know for the, the mesh network, uh, we've had a lot of good people who have kind of built up this inf this set of software from FOSS software. So, like, they use Libra Mesh and they use the Drizzle and all of that. Mm -hmm. Labors of love. Um, I, by the way, I, I liked the way you viewed the whole FOSS movement as it's great, but it's also kind of a net transfer of people's time to corporations. And that's that's an interesting perspective I hadn't heard. Um, yeah, I had seen throughout the industry, like throughout my time in the industry, and I always wondered how we were going to make the switch. You know, um, all of these tools enable the individual. So it's giving more and more power to the individuals. But the individuals, you know, the more that they're working for the corporation, like the, the net effect is against them because these are companies that then went on to just lay off hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you make the switch from, from the, you know, to the point where the, the power of the individuals, which they have all of these amazing tools at their finger, fingertips, how is that working for, you know, the collection of people, you know, everyone, not just for the employer. Uh, and, you know, I always thought it was interesting. You know, we're, we're heading down this path, like, what is going to be the thing that makes the switch? And then, you know, I at a point where, you know, the world seemed a bit more interactive. <laughs> and I started thinking about, you know, how can I help facilitate the switch as opposed to, you know, how the heck is this going to happen? You know, it's, it's more of an active process. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting how many software are just like one or two people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is it, oh, I think it was open SSL? Like there was a whole vulnerability that was there. Heartbleed. Probably. Yeah, Heartbleed. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, it was back. And um, like suddenly, yeah, it's just kind of two guys and a whole bunch of other people are just putting in submissions. And it's like, yeah, maybe we should like give them some money to make this thing that we find vital. <laughs> yeah, and so the company I was working for then ended up dedicating a significant amount of resources. We hired multiple people to work on OpenSSL. Oh, wow. Uh, and, you know, like so, some of the core members of the OpenSSL team ended up being you know, employee, like coworkers of mine. Right. Uh, you know, th these are positive things, you know, for the perspective of the engineers, like I understand where they're coming from and, you know, they're trying to do the right thing. It's just that the context that they're operating in isn't in the best interest of them, you know? So like, I, I like it when I see that sort of thing where, you know, people step up where, where needed. I mean, another, another one that, uh, you know, my company, uh, the company I worked for helped invest in was uh, NTP, the time protocol. Yep. It was this whole project to uh, improve the security of the, the main NTP district, NTP sec, mm -hmm. where they, you know, they made massive uh, contributions to the, the, the quality of the code there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in this case like this, I mean, I'm certainly not saying, you know, all corporations are bad. Well, in some ways they are, but, you know, like, it's not like the people are bad. 
You know, it is just that we have internalized this idea of how we should interoperate with within society, within industry. You know, we get led to this place of you know this is how the how business works. You learn how things work from your experience dealing with it. You know, and it's it's hard to take a step back and say. Yes, it works this way, but does it have to work this way? Is it good that it works this way? You know, what could we be doing instead? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. In some ways, I feel like that's a lot, like, that is a wider systemic issue. Because as I, you know, you know, as I said, you know, the capitalism in the last 50 years has basically been privatizing profit and um and, and socializing risk i mean we we see it whether it's the financial crisis whether it's the you know what we're doing to the planet there you know cory doctor has certainly talked about the num you know as we see economic concentration there's a small number of providers who will make say hospital beds and then they put their little digital rights management onto the hospital bed you you, oh, you can't use the hospital bed with this third party device, yeah. you have to like buy our device and then they just interoperate. It's like the Apple model, you know? Yeah, I mean, Tesla has brought click through licenses to cars these days. Oh, you know, <laughs> you know uh, they, they sell you stuff and then disable the ability to use it until you pay them more money. Right. Like self driving, right. you know, that's on an, that's on a physical add on. No. The battery capacities, you know, they limit the capacity of the battery if you have the cheaper version, and they unlock it with software if you pay them more. Which makes no sense because the whole point is to get people to use electric cars. Like I have a gas tank. There's not like there's me. You could theoretically have multiple gas tanks if it's like oh, I, if I pay more, I get the additional gas tank. But why build it in the first place? Yeah, I mean, the same mindset is all throughout the tech industry, though. Right. You know, and it, it, maybe it makes a bit more sense in the software world than it does in the world of physical devices. But, you know, taking it to physical devices kind of demonstrates the absurdity. <laughs> I mean, the, hey, you're, you stop making payments on your car, we will drive it to the impound lot. <laughs> you know, the self driving car will just drive itself there it back pay us five hundred dollars plus your back fees <laughs> you know? yeah save the tow truck and the tow company <laughs> it's yeah. oh, um Do you have anything else you want to discuss? I don't know. I'm feeling it's been a long. It hasn't been a long day, but it's been a long day. <laughs> I don't think there's anything else for me right now. Okay. Um, you know, if you're interested in hearing more or collaborating, feel free to reach out. Um, but otherwise, this was a good good chance to talk. I really appreciate it. Would you be able to share the slide deck at some point? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, great. And could we put it up on at Mass Pirates? Sure. Great. Thank you. Okay, and um, you, you said that on YouTube eventually, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, we're recording it now, and then um, you know it'll get processed, and I'll I'll upload it. So okay, great, cool. Well, with that, um, a little early. Um, uh, thanks for folks online who are watching it. Thanks to Greg for coming out for this and for your presentation. Thanks for having me. Uh, and uh, for folks who will ultimately view this, thanks for watching it. The next, we'll have a poll out uh, for the winter conference about when we should do that, probably January time. Which of, uh, <clears throat> that could theoretically be longer than, we, have, we get kicked out of here. So <laughs> that could be a longer period of time since it's all virtual. So. Uh, and with that, I will stop the recording. Thanks again.